We are now approaching bus stop number 17, International Terminal. My uncle Spanky is a baggage handler at San Francisco International Airport. He's done it for nearly three decades since he first came to the United States from the Philippines. He got his first bad injury in 2004, tore two tendons in his shoulder, another in his wrist. Then, a few years ago, the toil caught up with him again. I was just thinking, load the bag, load the bag, load the bag. And I twisted my back to load the bag, and then boom, ouch. A disc in his back had slipped. He missed 18 months of work. He thought about retiring, but there were still bills to pay. But his life didn't have to be this way. You see, Michael Spanky is a motherfucking rock star. That's him in the orange shirt and the fly shades. Spanky was one of the founding members of a Filipino band called VST and Company. The S stands for Spanky, who wrote and produced songs and played guitar. The V and T stand for Vic and Tito, the lead singers. Together they were the Bee Gees of the Philippines, part of a wave of 70s disco bands that redefined Filipino popular culture. Folks called this renaissance Manila Sound. Spanky grew up in a quaint mountain town north of Manila. In his earliest memories, his parents are playing records of old Spanish songs on a gramophone in the living room, sometimes dancing together, almost always singing along. At 25, he found work as a producer at a record company in the city. It was there he met two brothers, Vic and Tito, who liked his ear for music. They hit it off and VST was born. To stand out from other local bands, VST built their sound on disco fusing high-octane melodies with traditional Filipino love songs. They released their first record in 1977. Their debut single, Awitin Mo at Isasayoko, was a fast, rolling, energetic jam whose title seemed to embody the band's mission statement. Sing your song and I will dance. It immediately went gold. Early one morning, a few months later, Spanky was taking a cab home, exhausted after an 18-hour recording session. The cab broke down. Spanky stood by the side of the road, smoking a cigarette, while the driver tinkered under the hood. Just then, a bus full of nursing students crawled by in the rush hour traffic. And they started, ah, and then the whole bus started screaming, and I was just looking, and the cab driver got out of the hood, looked at the bus, then looked at me, then looked at the bus, and looked at me. I go, what are they screaming about? And they were looking at me and I just waved. And when I waved, the more they scream. It was the first time Spanky realized he was famous. It all felt so fast. One day he'd been playing proms and college parties. The next, he was touring the country. He even showed up on a list of the sexiest men in the Philippines, alongside six movie stars, two basketball stars, and Joanne's boyfriend? And that was just the beginning. He started hosting American Idol style talent shows. They say, hey, uh, but why don't you try television? I said, uh, why me? They said, just be yourself. Okay. He became a regular on sketch comedy shows. He starred in movies. These were the years after President Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law in the Philippines, ushering in a dictatorship that would last more than a decade. It was a scary time for many people. The economy was stumbling and the government jailed and killed those who opposed it. As soon as the VST show ended, the crowd of thousands quickly deserted the venue to rush home before midnight curfew. Spanky's fame insulated him from much of the turmoil. The way he saw it, his duty as an entertainer was to help relieve the fear so many felt. To help people forget. He occupied the upper crust of Philippine society. Red carpets, A-list clubs, celebrity basketball tournaments, adoring mobs any time he was in public. Invitations from dictator Marcos himself to Mulliken Young Palace to entertain dignitaries and cronies lining long banquet tables. His future was laid out for him. Big house, bigger beach house, drivers, maids, nannies, bodyguards, private school for the kids, and an endless string of well-paying, low-stress gigs. But 
1988, at the height of his fame and to the surprise of his bandmates, my Uncle Spanky left. Sometimes they would tell me, what the hell were you thinking about? You practically had it made here. A decade earlier, my grandmother had immigrated alone to San Francisco. She didn't know anyone there, didn't have any support network, so she eventually called for her family to join her. My Auntie Ging, Uncle Spanky's wife, arrived in 1981. It was supposed to be temporary, just long enough to help my grandma steady her feet on the road to the American dream. Auntie Ging would hop on a plane and visit Manila once a year, and in return Uncle Spanky would visit my auntie and their baby boy. Every time he landed in San Francisco, he found even more glamour than what he had left across the ocean. It was like going to La La Land. It was going to another dimension, another world. Everything I see, wow, beautiful. I couldn't see the dregs of life. I couldn't even see garbage. I couldn't even see homelessness. No, all I saw was, wow, what a beautiful place. It went on like this for seven years. But then, Auntie Ging was pregnant with another kid. Several of her siblings had joined her in California. She and Spanky were approaching middle age. They needed to be together. So they bought a house in Vallejo, California, where land was cheap. Spanky thought the place was perfect. Cherry, apple, lemon trees to pick, weekend barbecues in the backyard. Family and friends always passing by for long nights of beer and grilled meat. I mean, that house, to me at that time, was, whew, mm. that was paradise. But the sense of paradise was quickly punctured. The violence and despair of America's crack cocaine epidemic was the backdrop for Spanky's new suburban life. Burglars broke into his new home. The Vallejo shipyards had closed and unemployment was soaring. Through a Filipino friend, Spanky managed to get a job at the airport loading carts for airplane kitchens. The first time he saw one, he thought, I'm working here? I mean, I'm working here? I don't even know what a kitchen looks like. And it's dirty, it's clattered, it's a lot of people, it's a... Uh, Wow, is that, well, I'll give it a try. He worked 16 hour double shifts, pulling trays from carts, dumping them, loading them again and again. Some nights, his hands were still bloody when he got into his car for the 50 mile drive home to Vallejo. Several times I nearly fell asleep at the wheel. Sometimes while driving I'd think, why am I doing this? I'm not supposed to be doing this, but I'm doing it. Many nights those first few months, as the calluses hardened on his hands, Spanky thought about leaving. But there was a small voice in the back of my head that said, oh yeah, you can do it, you lazy bum. It's about time you work. And so he did. The first time I ever asked Michael Spanky whether he ever regretted coming here was two Christmases ago. Spanky said no. He gestured on all my cousins and aunties and uncles. How else would he be here with all this family? Still, I often wonder what my uncle's life would be like had he stayed in the Philippines instead. It's not hard to imagine. Spanky's bandmates, Tito and Vic, never left the islands. Vic still stars in movies and hosts television shows. Tito is Senate Majority Leader, one of the most powerful people in the country. His children, nieces and nephews, are actors, singers, politicians. They live in luxury and their wealth will grow for generations. I couldn't help but push my uncle again. Was it really worth it to leave all that behind? I don't know if I would be able to give to them what they have now if we were in the Philippines. Why? Whatever successes you do in the Philippines, there are always a price to pay. That price was fear. His friends always thought he was a fool for not carrying a gun. That price was a suffocating hold of fame and comfort in a country where food and opportunity are scarce to all except those at the top. That price was the gilded cage of a society where sons and daughters are expected to carry on the family business. Whereas here in the States, at least they leave you alone, do your thing, 
to the best of your ability. Hey! Many Filipino immigrants will give you an answer like that, about the stagnation of the Philippine class system, about the dangers of life in the developing world, about the liberty available here and nowhere else. I don't know if it's always worth it. I grew up here. I have the luxury to see America from the inside out, to see the inequality, the hate, the relentless grind that awaits our tired, hopeful new arrivals. A one-way ticket to the States guarantees nothing but that. We want to believe we're better off for the sacrifice our parents made for us, because it hurts too much to think otherwise. Innocent people are still getting killed by the Philippine government after all, but maybe our exodus helps perpetuate a self-fulfilling prophecy. Spanky's almost 70 now. The wind that batters the SFO tarmac still bites at his face, eight hours a day, five days a week, sometimes on Christmas and always on football Sundays. He can go back to the Philippines anytime. He's still famous there. His bandmates pass along offers for television shows, reunion tours. Shit, he's even a little famous in the States. Sometimes he signs autographs for random Filipinos at the grocery store or poses for selfies on the sidewalk. And every now and then, he takes a journey back to the life he left. The shows aren't what they used to be. Weddings, sweet sixteens, New Year's Eve and Fisherman's Wharf restaurants. But in those moments, as he sings the songs he once sang in front of thousands, swings a body that doesn't move as easily as it once did. In those moments, it's even more clear now than it ever was. My Uncle Spanky is a motherfucking rock star. <laughs>